Hello and welcome to the Book Table's Christmas special episode brought to you by Backroom Whispering Productions. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the broad topic of religion and children's literature by focusing on three popular and influential children's series, His Dark Materials, Harry Potter, and The Chronicles of Narnia. Today, we'll be doing something a little different. Because this is such a big topic and we have discussants who wanted to be involved but are unable to attend this recording, we have a brave moderator, Dorothy, who will keep us on track and read out relevant responses when she can. Hi, I'm Dorothy, and I'll be the moderator today, so we hope you enjoy this moderation experience. I'm going to try to keep us from getting too off track. I will also be reading a few notes from our friend Sarah, who couldn't be here for recording today, and I'll try to work her points into the questions and prompts. Could everyone please start with an introduction? Your name, your favorite children's or YA book or series, and the religious tradition that you identify with. Okay, I'll start. Uh, my name is Rebecca. My favorite children's slash YA book series is, I'm probably going to have to go with Harry Potter on this one, but His Dark Materials comes in a close second. Um, and I was raised Catholic, went to Catholic school, but I currently identify as non-religious. Okay, I'll go next then. Hello, my name is Mad, and kind of like Rebecca, my favorite childhood book series was very likely Harry Potter closely followed by the His Dark Materials. Um, I was raised Roman Catholic by my mom, though my dad is Greek Orthodox, uh, but currently I'm on the atheism agnosticism spectrum. So I guess sort of non-religious. So as I said before, I'm Dorothy, and my favorite YA series would definitely be Alana the Lioness by Tamora Pierce. Um, and I was raised Roman Catholic and have a big question mark over me right now. I will also be reading for Sarah, whose favorite series was the Redwall books, um, but of the ones we're discussing today, she prefers Harry Potter. And as a child, she went to various Christian churches, but doesn't really identify with anything at this point, and never had any formal Bible study or anything like that, so she will have that kind of perspective. Okay, uh, my name is Louisa. My favorite children's series I kind of come in between Sarah and Dorothy. Um, my favorites were Redwall and then um, The Immortals Quartet by Tamara Pierce. And I was raised UCC, which is United Church of Christ. Um, it's pretty much as far to the left as you can get in Christianity without falling into Unitarianism, for anyone who cares. Um, and I'm pretty much still in that tradition. Hi, my name is Aki. Um, my favorite young adult series is the uh, Chronicles of Pride Rain, but among the ones that we're discussing today, I probably like Narnia the best. And I was raised uh, Hindu, and I still identify with that in a cultural sense, but more broadly, since it's such a synchristic religion, like I like to throw in elements from a lot of different religions and pick and choose and play around a bit. All right, thanks. Let's dive right into it. Of course, during this discussion, we can bring in other books and series, but in regards to what I'm going to call the big three, His Dark Materials, Harry Potter, and Chronicles of Narnia, did any of those series have an impact on your religious experience? Like, did they prompt a conversion or questioning your faith? So actually, I would like to talk a little bit about His Dark Materials for a minute. Um, so this is Rebecca again. And I don't know that there was anything conscious um in terms of reading his dark materials and later questioning faith and religion and eventually becoming non-religious but I see them now I'm definitely not going to say as like my religious material but I super identify with his dark materials and the philosophy in them and the sort of anti-religious sentiment and so I suspect because I read them when I was a preteen that certainly had something to do with later when I was questioning sort of the things buried in my subconscious in terms of what I was thinking about philosophically. But otherwise, definitely Narnia and Harry Potter, I don't think, had anything to do with my religious experience. Hello, everybody. This is Matt. Um, I would just say in relation to this, I'm fairly similar, I think, to Rebecca in this regard. I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic. I attended like Sunday school, which happened on Saturday for some reason or another. And I was pretty good at picking up religious allegory and texts, probably because of this education. But I remember reading His Dark Materials when I was fairly young. I think I read the first two books when I was around eight years old. Honestly, I wasn't reading them for anything other than story. 
when I was picking those books up again as I was a little older, I think having read them when I was so much younger, they left an impression on me. And I was going through my own sort of crisis of faith with my mom and being forced through confirmation in the Catholic Church. And I picked up his dark materials again to give me something that would maybe be a little comforting. And I found that it helped me a lot. I could identify with the philosophy that was being touted in it. And as a result, I think it definitely pushed me more towards the thinking that I have nowadays. And kind of, as Rebecca said, I don't necessarily consider it my religious text, but it certainly has philosophies and other things that I identify very heavily with. I'd like to jump in also and uh, make a comment on this uh, question. Because I wasn't raised in a Christian tradition, unlike some of the other people here, uh, when I first read these books, I didn't read uh, his dark materials, but I read Narnia, and it was really hard for me to pick up on things because I didn't know what to look for. And it was only afterwards that I would have picked up on the uh, Christian elements in these series. So that's why, for me, none of these books really had any sort of religious uh, connotation. But I think even if I did know beforehand what what to look for, it wouldn't matter as much because I feel like a lot of the debates and arguments within these texts are really more relevant to you if you come from a Christian or especially Catholic background. So I kind of come in between those two ends because I was raised in a Christian tradition, but not one with a centralized institutional power because the UCC comes out of congregationalist churches and it's very up to individual congregations how they want to interpret things. And so like when I read Chronicles of Narnia, I was little and we listened to them like on audiobooks in the car on road trips. And I like I had conversations with my parents about the parallels. Um, but I also definitely like in my head I separated like books I was reading for fun versus religious stuff. So like even though those parallels were like really clear to me, like I don't, it didn't really have an impact on how I thought about my faith or how I practiced my faith. So that actually is a great segue into our next topic. We're going to discuss if we encountered these series as, as children or teens or adults and how you guys think it would be different if you had met these characters and themes at a different age. Uh, for example, if you, dear listeners, had heard the His Dark Materials podcast we recently did, I was the only one who had encountered those characters as an adult instead of as a child or teen. And it really does change how you perceive these books, so it would be really interesting to hear about that. Yeah, so I encountered all of them as children or teens. I mean, Narnia, my father read to me and my brother when we were kids, and they were presented as very, like, religious. Like, my dad would actually identify the parts where there was a metaphor or, like, Aslan is Jesus, right? Problem is, my first encounter with Narnia was in, like, a religious sort of context or reading it as religious metaphor, um, and I am sure as an adult, I would see it because I have done religious studies and that's what I studied in school. But I wonder if I would see it as heavily and I don't know because I can't, I guess I can't know. Um, but His Dark Materials, I read as a teen. And again, it was actually we read it for like a church youth group and focused a lot on the huge like killing God and what does that mean thing. So that was also in a super religious context, but Harry Potter wasn't. And I read Harry Potter as they came out. Like we are that lucky generation that grew up with Harry Potter. And I have read them again as an adult. And I think that I actually see more now. Um, like I think Louisa had pointed out earlier in a separate conversation that, okay, but Harry Potter does have like super religious allegory in it. Um, you know, you have someone sacrificing himself for everyone else and then being resurrected from the dead and all of this stuff. And I don't think I saw that when I first read it. But now when I go back, like I can see it and think about it more. So I, I think you definitely do pick up on more when you're older and have more experience and have read different things and studied different things. So I have a comment from Sarah. She said that the first time she encountered the Chronicles of Narnia, Quote, to me, it was just a cool fantasy series of talking animals and awesome characters. Uh, but then a couple years ago, she read it and saw a lot of the religious stuff that she had missed as a kid. She actually said, quote, I felt like I had been tricked with the lead in of the super cool story only to get a weird ending with a message that I didn't understand. 
but I think it would be interesting to try reading it again sometime soon. Yeah, I think that's sort of, for a lot of us, oftentimes how it goes, because we learn so much more as we grow up and we get a larger kind of knowledge base with stuff. I think I was just fortunate that when I read Narnia as a kid, I picked up on it really quickly. I actually went to my mom after I'd finished uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and just asked her, I said, is Aslan Jesus? And she's like, how did how did you know? Because I had, I'd just been given them as a box set as a gift from my mom. And I know as a kid, when I read Narnia, I, I was reading it really just for the story because I was probably only about eight years old. Um, and I liked it, but I didn't necessarily love it. But I definitely found a shift when I read it again, when I was older as a teen. And then again, as an adult that I really did not like the Chronicles of Narnia. It really just didn't work for me when I tried to read it again as an adult. There was something I found, I think, more about the writing style than the message because I'd already encountered the message as a kid and I'd sort of gotten it already. But in terms of encountering things as a child versus as an adult, that was one series where I underwent a really serious shift in terms of how I felt about the novels personally. I think part of encountering specifically the Chronicles of Narnia as an adult is that um, when I recently was rereading them um, to these kids that I used to nanny for, um, the stuff that I picked up on that I hadn't before was just a lot of things that I think were reflective of the fact that they were written in the 40s and 50s, like sticking to gender roles and the sort of kind of heavy-handed prose. I think that has a lot to do with when he was writing compared to the other series that we're looking at it's you know it's decades earlier and so it's kind of weird to be like drawing parallels between these two three series when they come from such different time periods yeah that's definitely valid harry potter was very much our generation i mean yeah they there was a period of time where we were the exact same age as Harry and his companions, and it was very mm -hmm. current to us, even though he didn't necessarily have the internet and smartphone, they had a lot of the same ideas about, like, equality, and, I don't know, there's some racial diversity stuff, there's just more current topics that are more relevant to us at the age that we were. Yeah, and, like, ways of speaking, like, how you speak to a child as an adult, I think, has changed pretty dramatically in the past 50 years. So I think that's definitely part of it. Yeah, also. I think that's definitely kind of like I was saying why I didn't like the writing style of Narnia was that I just found it so overwhelmingly condescending to its audience, which was really why I objected to it in c contrast to things like, I guess, Harry Potter and his Dark Materials, which I didn't feel were as condescending. And then in with a completely different series even you something like Percy Jackson and the Olympians tries even harder to speak like the current generation I didn't I personally didn't mind the uh, style of Narnia um I thought it was kind of quaint in a charming way I see the same themes whether or not they're religious or secular in both Harry Potter and Narnia so one doesn't feel more religious to me other than the fact that you know we we input uh, Jesus into Aslan, but as someone pointed out before, uh, Harry basically goes through the same thing that Aslan goes through. They both seem like they try to convey a sense of morality that emphasizes the heroic, and that's kind of like a timeless thing, whether you're writing your book in the 50s or like 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, both um, even all three of these stories really, I think, are just sort of following what Joseph Campbell likes to call the monomyth, which is just the hero's journey. A lot of them mm -hmm. have their moment where they descend into death, hell, the crucible, whatever you want to call it, and come out stronger on the other side. So I, I guess you're right. You really can just use these all as either religious or secular, depending on how you want to look at it. I think the reason that Narnia gets grouped so heavily with the religious end and then, um, his dark materials for its own obvious reasons. Uh, Narnia, probably just because it's had 40 years of people saying that it is, if nothing else. <laughs> it's had 40 years of people to be like, look, look at all the parallels, look at the symbolism. And then I think also in addition to C.S. Lewis's other body of works, um, where he was clearly very interested in religion and spirituality. Um, 
But yeah, you definitely can look at all of these in a very secular way because the hero's journey, it's the monomyth, it's universal. And I think that leads us pretty well into um, the question of banned books and the fact that His Dark Materials and Harry Potter have spent a fair amount of time on quote-unquote banned books lists and Narnia hasn't. And what Mad was saying earlier about how Narnia's had 40, 50, 60 years of people saying that it has those Christianity parallels and talking about them, whereas Harry Potter hasn't had that time, even though basically the same parallel exists. And so Sarah had a comment about that as well. She said that Christians are the ones making the banned books list. And I think that is definitely true, at least in America, which I think is, in general, the banned books list that we're talking about. She said maybe it's that in Harry Potter, normal people can use witchcraft, but in Narnia, it's only the supernatural beings like Aslan. So the power is not necessarily with the people. Matt had a comment I, on this uh, in the doc. That's true. I did. I mean, I, I, it was sort of just bouncing off of what Sarah said um, in that I think she's definitely right. And there's a pretty heavy Judeo-Christian bias with who is making these lists and for the reasons that they're being made. It's always about some sort of moral code that seems to fall in line with that. I just found it interesting that because of that, Narnia is something that has escaped a lot of the like condemnation and just downright nastiness that Harry Potter and his dark materials have received in their time. I knew people who were not allowed to read Harry Potter in school, but Chronicles of Narnia was okay. I think to be clear, um, we should say like, rather than a Judeo-Christian bias, it really is a conservative Christian bias. True. Um, I don't really want to lump Judaism in there. Um, and I think also that going along with the fact that Chronicles of Narnia has been around for so long and like had so many Christian scholars looking at it and had uh, C.S. Lewis's other works to reflect his beliefs and everything. Um, I think going along with that, there's also the fact that Harry Potter doesn't have as many like parallels to Christianity that are clear early on. Like by the time the seventh book came out, I was old enough that I was certainly reading these things into it on my own. Um, and that's really where you see the death and resurrection of the protagonist. Um, so I think those, the early books got on the banned books lists early on because they didn't see those parallels and instead they saw witchcraft and wizardry and therefore obviously evil things. By the time that the books got into the parallels that those groups would maybe have like appreciated or liked it was too late. Like it was late enough that they'd already written them off as something that was outside of their belief system and unacceptable. See, I, I kind of wonder if there might be something else to it though. Um, because I'm sitting, I'm thinking about it and HDM, like obviously is going to be on a banned books list in a conservative Christian, like, you know, it's a super anti church, anti organized religion there's lots of very like heavy handed religious things in there at the end. They supposedly kill God and there's that whole thing. Harry Potter never made that much sense to me until a couple weeks ago when we first were thinking about this issue and someone brought up the fact that Twilight beat out HDM as like the most, or, and, and Harry Potter, I think is like one of the most banned books. Like people were more freaked out about Twilight than they were about HDM. And, like, obviously Twilight, from a conservative Christian perspective, is not great. But at the same time, <laughs> compared to, like, compared to HDM, like, uh, okay, it's not as bad. So what it makes me think is that, like, Harry Potter and Twilight and all of that, part of the reason that they end up on this banned books list is this sort of, like, pushback against popular culture that tends to happen where there's like this fear that people are just going to become so engrossed and fall so in love with these popular culture things that are like in and of themselves godless as it were, um, that they're going to not be focusing on religion or like what really matters from a conservative Christian standpoint. And so it seems to me that it's more that Harry Potter was so popular and people were like so into it and it was such a cultural phenomenon it was less that they used the word witch and people had magic because there are plenty of like Christian accepted things where people have magic, like Lord of the Rings, for example, where like the Jesus character in there is a wizard. Hello. <laughs> so I don't know. I like I maybe I'm crazy, but I think that that has a lot to do with it is the sort of like 
fear that popular culture is going to overtake religion in the minds of children. And so these super popular things become very scary from that perspective. Well, there's a reason that uh, things become cult movies. We use that word for a reason. I mean, Rocky Horror Picture Show, whatever, it's not necessarily the themes in it. It's that people dedicate their time to it and wear t-shirts of it and have posters on their walls and join groups and discuss it and participate in it. And I think to some people's mindset, that's taking away from religious practices or from contemplating I guess, higher mysteries. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that cult gets now applied that way because I remember first hearing about cult when, and this is probably because my upbringing was so very strange, my uh, maternal grandfather is a now retired professor of the classics and he would talk to me about uh, Hellenic and Hellenistic religious rituals and practices and because it was a pantheon of many gods, each of these gods would often have multiple cults devoted to them and they were just called cults. They weren't a bad thing, it was just a small sect of people who worshipped in a certain way and now the word is used with um, such a negative connotation it immediately makes you think of something bad in a way. So that mention of the Hellenistic traditions actually transitions us. So, how about non-Christian religious themes in literature? Uh, While we were preparing for this episode, Aki mentioned Greek mythological characters getting borrowed or squished into other narratives and not respected as much as Christian's themes. And Sarah's input on that was, I think the simple answer is just that there aren't as many people who still believe in the Greek gods anymore. It's not a major religion, so there isn't really anyone to get up in arms about it not being respected. I'm interested to know if there are any fantasy books that borrow from or try to appeal to other religions that are still widely practiced. Yeah, I think she's right on that. What? (laughs) Good answer. (laughs) Nope. Yeah, in terms of whether or not there are other uh, books that, uh, there are books that appeal to other religions, I can't really say. But I think what she said about that people just don't practice, you know, the Hellenic and Hellenistic polytheism anymore is definitely kind of right on the money, whereas Christianity is obviously still going strong. And in terms of how it gets squished or really, I think, appropriated into other things, people picking and choosing into it is because, especially in the case of Greek and Roman religious literature, it's just viewed as myth. That word myth just gets put on. It's not considered a religious text. It's just myth. And we view myth almost the way we view fiction because people are still so close, I think, to Christianity using the word myth often will and applying it to the Bible will make people very uncomfortable. So I think it's just sort of this pervasiveness of that word myth and versus a religious or holy text. Well, I mean, um, I guess I would kind of agree with Matt, but I'd turn it around a bit. And instead of saying, um, hey, um, we should treat the Bible as myth too, um, why not treat the Greek myths as like real? Um, At least that's how I see it. I think... Mad's taking the view that, oh, these are all um, stories, these are all fictions that um, have inspired literature, but some people take the Christian stories more seriously than the Greek stories. But I can, I would say, we can say that the Greek stories could also be taken just as seriously as the Christian stories when reading something like Narnia, for example. Like, if Narnia turns a person towards the Christian religion, it's also possible that because they're fawns and nymphs and other things, um, you know, when you're standing next to trees or like next to a river and you're in nature, you might feel the presence of a nymph, like after reading Narnia. Like, I mean, that's definitely something like I did after reading Narnia. I began talking to trees when I was in the fifth grade and I began to feel that trees maybe have spirits in them. So um, I don't think, I mean, I, I think I think it can definitely work both ways. Yeah, I think it just has to do with how you view the word myth versus religious text. Like, I mean, I say myth and I don't mean to mean it sort of disparagingly. I take myth and religious and holy texts to all be equal. And whether that means you do believe or don't believe is sort of, I think, up to the individual. Um it sounds more like I'm, I'm treating them all as if they're just fictions because that's where I'm coming from on a personal standpoint. But if somebody views, is, views a myth and a religious text and a holy text, all those words mean the same thing to mean that they're all real and you genuinely feel it, then good for them. I'm totally on for that. I think it's a much more individual process. I also think something to sort of keep in mind when we're thinking about um, these other like 
cultures and how they're appropriated. So we think about the three big ones that appear in fantasy, right? Which is Norse mythology, Greek mythology, and like Egyptian mythology. And so, yes, there are the gods in the modern world. Most of them aren't believed in anymore. So authors don't have to worry about, I guess, you know, like upsetting people or trying to stick to a really, or have even a particularly religious message. Um, They're just kind of available as names that are familiar to people. Um, But the other thing is that most of what appears, as we've been talking about, is these mythological characters, right? Like nymphs and satyrs and centaurs. Um, And the thing is that in Christianity, there like really aren't very many that you could even use. So angels appear all over the place um, as pretty much the only non-human character that's like culturally accepted as a Christian thing. And I mean, I could go like hardcore Bible scholar on you here and talk about Genesis chapter six and the giants and the Nephilim and everything. But nobody, like if they appeared, nobody would think of that as like, this is a Christian mythology thing that's happening right now. Um, So I think that's also a big part of it. Like part of it is obviously there aren't people around necessarily to get up in arms about you're doing Norse mythology wrong. This is a God that I believe in and worship, or at least not very many people versus Christianity. But on the other hand, there's actually like, I don't know that there's that much to borrow from Christianity or to use in like a literary or fantasy setting that we could even use as an example of something that is avoided. I don't know if Mm -hmm. you guys agree with that, but that's, what I think. I mean, I agree with you, and I think that comes back to the thing that Christianity is mostly mined by authors for its actual, like, philosophical or um, soteriological worldview, whereas um, mythology is mined by authors for their various beasts and whatever, whatnot, like plants and nymphs and whatever. So in that sense, like, obviously these authors give Christianity more respect because they're treating it as a philosophical system. And when they need giants, they're not going to get giants from the Bible. They'll get giants from Norse mythology or whatever. But you can also take, I mean, I suppose you could do this, but authors don't seem to do it. You could take the philosophical themes that come out of Greek or Norse or whatever, Hindu mythology, and try to use that. But... No, those mythologies are really just used to cast side characters for the main um, the main dish is um, Christian philosophy or whatever. And is that how it's treated in the Percy Jackson books? It's been a while since I've read them, but it did seem like they threw in random... Actually, no, I don't want to say it's what it seemed like because I'm probably wrong. The, the Percy Jackson books did draw from... Greek mythologies yeah yeah they the yeah men. they did like yeah. he actually i think made a conscious effort while he twisted a lot of the characters and motivations and such to suit the story he was telling he didn't sort of just grab random things in percy jackson at least he, he was trying to stay within the little box he built for himself of this is greek mythology let's not mess with it and he used separate series to go after the romans and the egyptians now i believe he's doing the norse i haven't read any of that yet so i I don't know for certain what exactly is going on in there okay cool um did anybody have anything else to add on the non-christian religious themes category all right well then we can run to our next question which is Our big three for this talk seem to run on a spectrum, with His Dark Materials having organized religion in churches, Narnia having more religious themes, and Harry Potter having more moral ethical themes. Obviously, there's, you know, a little bit of overlap in these categories, but do you think these were deliberate choices to avoid or anger different religious groups? Yes. (laughs) I think in the case of His Dark Materials, it's pretty... Well, very deliberate. Uh, it's often been touted as the anti-Narnia. Um, and I know that Pullman is a very large critic of Lewis. And with the fact that he was on a literary level trying to invert Paradise Lost, I think you're basically throwing kind of a massive middle finger to a lot of organized religion and Christian beliefs. And if you're trying to do that, and the fact that he genuinely is a very intense atheist and all of that uh with narnia i think i like to 
think that Lewis was making a conscious effort to do his large amounts of biblical allegory. Uh, I have admittedly not read as much of Lewis in terms of his body of work as I have in relation to, I guess, percentage uh, when it comes to him versus Pullman. But for J.K. Rowling, at least, in Harry Potter, I've never really found in too many interviews her talking about religion or religious themes in relation to Harry Potter. And I think I, I view it more in terms of how it would work in the story. We've talked about the the resurrection and all of that, but if she were to try and go, say, the His Dark Materials route and have, like, organized religion in the story, it's I sit there and go, I don't see where it would need to be added to enhance the story anymore i i maybe this is just me and my personal belief that i don't necessarily need it in there it's kind of interesting when it's put in there and done well but with harry potter i went it's the wizarding world with organized religion i don't know just the sort of it not being there it was never really an issue for me and when i thought of trying to add it i kept thinking of where i'd want to put it other than like various throwaway lines of people were going to church or something uh well, they do. They do have the Yule Ball. That's true. And that's they don't mention. Oh, we're celebrating the religious tradition of Yule, <laughs> but they do have some more, you know, Christmas present type things going on. And I think it would be interesting to see if, because this wizarding community does draw from different areas and different um, ethnic backgrounds. You've got the Patil twins. Um, you've got obviously muggles versus wizards so it would be kind of neat for, in my opinion to see somebody i don't know getting mad that the yule ball is or isn't christmas that would be very reflective of the that real would be world. so reflective hashtag of red America cup right now let's be real <laughs> uh, hashtag red cup uh, so the way i see harry potter like i think harry potter is a good reflection of like, modern Western society, it takes, like, Christian themes, but, like, completely secularizes them and doesn't talk about them in a Christian context whatsoever. But it still has, like, a sense of this is an absolute good and this is an absolute, like, evil, and here are some moral and ethical things, blah, blah, blah. Like, people still want to believe in these types of things, but without any of the, I guess, religious aspects to it, and that's why I think fantasy is such a popular genre today, because modern fantasy does often explore things in a kind of black and white way, but without um, seeming preachy. And Harry Potter does the same thing. Like, it gives you it gives you the things that people probably like from religion without actually discussing it in a religious light in any way whatsoever. But there's still that framework that carries into Harry Potter. Well, I think also, though, you think about the difference in the projects and Harry Potter, whether or not religion is an influence, which it probably was, because we live in a world where religion is just part of cultural norms, and that's the world that J.K. Rowling grew up in, and so whether or not she meant to, religious themes are going to appear. But she wasn't writing something, I think, that was specifically meant to be religious. She was writing a fantasy story that was meaningful to her and, you know, to millions of the rest of us in the world. No, and, I agree with you. Um, whereas, you know, Narnia, while I don't think Lewis was out to like, you know, I'm going to teach children about religion. Um, he was very religiously minded when he wrote it. He had specific themes in mind and he was also living in a culture where it was much more common for literature to be heavily religious. Um, and then, you know, Pullman obviously was very consciously anti-religious, wanting to push back against Lewis and reverse sort of Milton's Paradise Lost in this story. So obviously, I think religion then is necessarily a bigger element of those because of the nature of the project. Yeah, so we do have another discussion question, and this relates to Susan in Narnia. Mm -hmm. and why she falls away from Narnia by book seven. What does it mean? Does someone just want to remind us what happened to Susan and Narnia? Sure. Um, at the end of the final book, The Last Battle, uh, the Pevensies are discovered to be all dead, with the exception of Susan, because of a train crash they were on. Uh, and Susan is said that she... Uh, has fallen away from Narnia, she will never be, like, a friend of Narnia anymore and cannot follow the other Pevensies and Aslan into Aslan's 
home his land, the kind of allegorical heaven, because she is uh, no longer a friend of Narnia because she's interested in makeup and all nylons, I believe is the word they use. And she, when they try to talk about Narnia, she says, you, you know, you still believe in that thing from when we were children. So it's really that she's considered no longer a friend of Narnia and therefore will never be welcome into this allegorical heaven. Okay, so Sarah said, as a child, I remember feeling really sad that Susan had forgotten Narnia and her time being a queen, but I thought her character was just supposed to be showing that adults are boring, and how sad it is that we sometimes lose our childlike sense of adventure when we grow up. But reading it again within the religious context, I agree that there's more to it than that. Um, and she contemplates if, it's, if this is a sexist decision, because, sure, nylons and lipstick imply a party girl, or Lewis trying to say she couldn't go to heaven because she's immoral. Um, and then, thinking about it more and reading his quotes about it, she doesn't think his thinking was quite that sinister. So Lewis says, The books don't tell us what happened to Susan. She is left alive in this world at the end, having by then turned into a rather silly, conceited young woman. But there's plenty of time for her to mend, and perhaps she will get to Aslan's country in the end in her own way. Yeah, I I don't know. One of the things that distressed me most when I reread Narnia as a teen was the treatment not only of Susan, but just kind of adult females in general. Um, my favorite of the books had always been The Magician's Nephew, and the ultimate antagonist of that is Jadis, who later becomes the White Witch of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But when I was rereading the series as a whole, I just kind of found this feeling of general distrust and perhaps even dislike of adult women, and adult women who were, like, emancipated, who had an element of power to them. And I have a couple quotes here, the first one being from Philip Pullman, who obviously was our author of his Dark Materials, and yes, he is a very well-known critic of Lewis and of Narnia, and he finds the uh, entire series as, quote, monumentally disparaging of women. And in relation to Susan, he says, Susan, like Cinderella, is undergoing a transition from one phase of her life to another. Lewis didn't approve of that. He didn't like women in general or sexuality at all, at least at the stage in his life when he wrote the Narnia books. He was frightened and appalled at the notion of wanting to grow up, which is something that I sort of associated with Susan, uh, especially in that bit from The Last Battle. And so... I'm going to now quote J.K. Rowling, who obviously was our author of Harry Potter, and she says, There comes a point where Susan, who was the older girl, is lost to Narnia because she becomes interested in lipstick. She's become irreligious basically because she found sex, and I have a big problem with that. And I, 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 perhaps this has to do with the cultural norms of the time back in the 40s and the 50s, where that was sort of a, you know, you didn't really talk about it, and it was not necessarily seen as something to celebrate or be very open about. Um but it still just really upsets me that that's what happens to Susan at the end of the book. And that just because she's interested in being an adult and being engaged in things which could be representative of becoming um, a sexual being, she's therefore cast out of Narnia. So then is Pullman emphasizing Lyra's budding sexuality just a big old middle finger to that? I think it definitely was. <laughs> I think a lot of his dark materials was meant to be a massive middle finger to Narnia. Um, and I think that particular moment in the Amber Spyglass, especially because he very much embraces the idea of Lyra having basically a sexual awakening and becoming a sexual being, because he, he later brings up what he calls the argument of innocence versus experience. And he says experience is always better than just innocence and naivete, which I think is sort of what Lewis was demanding of the Pevensies so that they could enter heaven, was that they were almost stunted in their maturation because they had to maintain that innocence. So I'm going to, uh, I guess, be the defender of Lewis in this uh, particular argument and argue that I don't think he was trying to be sexist. I can definitely see how modern, like early 21st century um, viewpoint on Lewis would read back into his uh, work and see um, what happened to Susan as a sexist thing. And I definitely agree with Matt that um, Lewis is not in favor of experimentation, and um, he hews to a more classical tradition where the virtues are loyalty and sticking with tradition and following what came before you and you know going by the book. But I don't think that's uh, targeted against Susan, and that's definitely uh, not targeted against her in a sexist way, because we know 
what happened to Edmund in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and he did a lot of things, and if he had persisted in doing what he was doing, like betraying his family, um, helping the White Witch, he would have probably been cast out of Narnia too. And if you think about it, several of the characters in the Narnia series, um, the strongest characters are also women, and they include Lucy, who you could argue is the main main protagonist and hero of the entire series, and also Jill. And I, I don't think you could say Lucy and Jill are subservient women, you know, who just, like, listen to men or get bossed around or whatever. They definitely have their own minds and do their own things. But I think the difference between them and Susan is that they... Um, I think Susan kind of, in C.S. Lewis's view, becomes really arrogant and feralist, whereas Lucy and Jill are more grounded in what matters, I guess, um, what really matters in real life, and things like honor and helping your friends and uh, being heroic and whatever. So I, I think there's a lot to say about um, you know women also being heroes in the series, and obviously we have examples like Edmund and also Eustace later on who are quite nasty at certain points, and there's there's nothing to imply that they would not have been cast out as well if the circumstances at that time were the same. Except that they they aren't cast out. Like, having them cast out is still a narrative choice. He could have had them cast out if he wanted it to be at the same level as Susan. I think I come in on this sort of between the two of you in that I don't think it's debatable that there's an element of misogyny in Lewis. There absolutely is. But... I also think, like, going back to Mad's argument about it being possible that it's, like, an element of the philosophy of the time or whatever, I think it's partly that, but I think it's dangerous to just say that it's that. Because, um, for instance, like, the last time that I encountered these books was, again, reading them to kids that I was nannying for, so they were uh, 10 and 7 at the time, they're both girls. Um, and I remember at one point we got to the part of the vo in um, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, I think it is, where... Um, Eustace, like, quotes, I think it's his mom, as saying that, basically, like, men's attempts at chivalry are, in a way, sexist. And the way that that's framed in the narrative is that that's a ridiculous notion, and that can't possibly be. Um, so I think there is an element of it being a, pro a product of the time, of Lewis's writing sort of being a product of the time and his viewpoint. Um, but I also think he was not very open to... Uh, actually listening to women about their experiences. And so I think that he wouldn't be at the forefront of that anyway. So here's a quote from Sarah, who is not with us tonight. So is Lewis's choice of which sin to give Susan's character sexist? In my opinion, yes. Is her not arriving in real Narnia sexist? Personally, I don't think so. So what Sarah is saying, or how I'm reading what she's saying, is that, yes, any of the characters could have gotten kicked out, but any of the characters could have experienced a, a variety of different sins. It could have been lust, it could have been greed, it could have been basically any sin, but he did pick a female character, and he did pick sort of a, a more female sin. So I think that that's a point worth making. Yeah, I think she's right because I mean, while we just, while there are definitely other characters who are shown to have, um, I guess you could say, overindulged in bad behavior, I think they mention in the Magician's Nephew that the kingdom from which Jadis comes, she talks about our uh, the previous kings having been one who was very vain or something like that. But he could have cast out Edmund for all of his sins. I mean, he was uh, pretty much, I mean, if even we were to just look at him in Turkish Delight, there's gluttony. Let's just kick him out for gluttony. <laughs> but <laughs> instead, it's Susan for his view of someone being a conceited, silly woman. And I'm like, that that just seems so shallow to kick someone out of Narnia for. And I think, I think the use of silly is really yeah. important because that is used so often to dismiss teenage girls and young women. Um, and even in Lewis's later quote, which uh, kind of helps his cause a little bit, but it also has him calling her a conceited and silly young woman, which is just falling right back into misogynistic tropes that we are well familiar mm -hmm. with. It's demeaning, too, because you would call... a uh, 
a three-year-old boy. Oh, he's so silly. But uh, a 12, 13-year-old boy? No. No. But it's totally fine to call a pubescent girl that. It's very... It's yeah, very and even weird. then, how old are they at the end of the series? I mean, she's a she's a not older than prepubescent when he calls her that. She's yeah, grown. she's an adult. Pretty I'm like much. that's <laughs> that's even more disparaging and just downright rude. It's like you don't call an adult woman a silly, conceited young woman. That's just it's infantilizing. Absolutely, is what it is. It's absolutely infantilizing. And we had mentioned that earlier when we were talking about the different writing styles in the series, as we did say that. Uh, we found it irritating how Narnia uh, condescends towards the characters, not just when they're children, but in general. Um, and it doesn't seem like that kind of thing happens as much in his Dark Materials or Harry Potter, although there is a really lovely quote from his Dark Materials where different characters talk about Lyra. Um, <laughs> that gives me joy. <laughs> <Your> favorite joy. <job. laughs> gives me joy. <laughs> Dirty under the fingernails, intelligent but not intellectual. Uh, but it doesn't call her silly and conceited. Well, I think what's funny about that, at least for me personally, is that I think you, Dorothy, would wish that there was more condescension <laughs> towards Lyra or anything in his dark <laughs> materials because she needs a little bit of something. But yeah, <laughs> she needs a slap up the head. <laughs> but I'm not kicking her out of heaven. Uh, did we want to touch on how the church organization in his Dark Materials is framed as the enemy of all that is good? <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, mean, because we, yeah, we, I mean, to me, there's not, I mean, I guess I'd be interested to hear what other people say, but to me, it doesn't seem like there's very much to that question. It's Pullman yeah. has an issue with organized religion, so the organized <laughs> religion is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want people to feel like we've been too hard on Christianity in particular because like that's the main religion that we've been like going at. I I guess like at some point like I should have pointed out that hey, these criticisms are totally valid for like other religions too. Like Yeah, but I I mean I think I think it's absolutely true that like the sort of like weird secular Christianity is like pretty pervasive in this country and it's not like I don't like it's not the same as like going after a different religion you know what I'm saying like it's not I mean as long as you're punching up man mm-hmm. it's... what does that mean punching up yeah like punching towards uh the dominant culture instead of oh down oh that makes sense yeah I mean, it would be interesting to see, like, maybe a few years from now, as, like, the genre grows and, like, more people begin reading fantasy, like, all over the world, like, what they think about it and if, like, things from other religions, like, are written about and get criticized and, like, how that debate plays out. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. Because I can't, I mean, I can't even think of, and, like, that might just be me coming from my background and position, but, like, I can't even think of, like, many representations of other religions in anything i mean the only thing i can think of right off the top of my head which has some like white savior problems um is in song of the lioness uh, um when alana goes out to the uh, vizier and the... the girls her her students um wear face veils mm-hmm. and like she has this moment of like why are you wearing face veils like how dare you like mm-hmm. this is not you know empowering to women and blah 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 blah, blah. and they basically are like they tell her to step off. They're like, no, I'm going to wear my veil like a normal person because it's a, my culture. This is my culture. Um, and so, like, there, like it's <laughs> that, like, storyline has some problems in general, but, like, it, it does address at least that small aspect for, like, a minute. Yeah, like, the only um, other representations I've seen have involved not religious texts, but, like, fairy tales. So, like, because fairy tales in terms, at least in the YA genre, have been, like, really the hot thing recently, like, messing with... Yeah, 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 yeah. There have been a couple that have come out involving uh, jinn. Uh, the Arabian Nights has been popular for the past, like, year. Um, and so, it, yeah. but there's nothing really of the religious mm-hmm. being brought into it. It's mostly just, oh, look, these are really great, cool stories. Let's put some spins on them and play with them. And some have been better than others, and some have been more respectful than others. We'd like to thank the participants for being involved in this conversation, taking time out of your day, and we'd also like to thank the listeners for joining us, and 
As always, feel free to tweet at us or Facebook at us your reactions to today's podcast. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Bye. 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 The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes. Or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. See you next time! Thank you.